Uh, now uh, we will have uh, uh, the speech from uh, uh, Nick Warner. Um, is another important moment for of our hub. Uh, Nick Warner is a member of the well-known member of ICMCI board who serves uh, now as a secretary of ICMCI and in the liaison office officer of the Institute of uh, Quality Assurance, uh, the former QAC. Uh, Nick will talk to us about the implementation of the new ICMCI competent framework, uh, which represent uh, a corner store for our professional growth and the prestigious uh, CMC designation. Dear Nick, uh, the floor now is yours. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cesara. Uh, I'm not sure where we are on the timekeeping at the moment. So uh, um, if, uh, if I'm taking too much time, I'm sure you'll let me know. I'm going to stop my uh, camera for a while so that uh, I can save a bit of bandwidth as I share my presentation. Okay. We, uh, we've already heard that the, uh, the consulting industry is under close scrutiny at the moment. Um, and we, as the representative body of the consulting profession, obviously have a mission to provide the right standards for professional management consultants in terms of individual competence, of uh, of complying with a robust code of ethical conduct and in following a good process in carrying out consulting assignments. Now, ICMCI has developed a very um, solid set of standards in our competence framework, our code of conduct, and our ISO 20700 checklist as a, a means of applying the standard of ISO 20700. This has been the work of the Professional Development and Standards Committee within ICMCI. Um, but equally important to having good standards in place is also the enforcement of those standards and making sure that the standards are upheld throughout um, our membership. Um, and the job of the Institute Quality Assurance is to actually ensure that our standards are well enforced throughout our member institutes. Um, and, and in order to give more strength to doing that job, uh, we now formally represent ourselves to the world as an accreditation body. Um, within ICMCI. Uh, this means that we uh, fully comply with the requirements of the International Standard 17011, 2017 version, which requires IQA as an accreditation body to demonstrate full independence, impartiality, to be legally responsible for its accreditation activities and to be disconnected from any consultancy or training activities in terms of the uh, bodies uh, whom we accredit. Um, we, in 2020, um, QAC as it then was, underwent um, an assessment against 17011 by an accredited assessor um, and found that uh, we were in a position to self-declare ourselves as an accreditation body. We are currently working in IQA to further develop um, our full compliance with ISO 17011 um, and aiming for a, uh, a repeat assessment externally by the end of this year. So um, 
IQA as an accreditation body can provide uh, accreditations against various schemes. The ones which we currently cover are obviously our own um, CMC scheme within our member institutes, but also we're able to offer accreditation to member institutes uh, against the standard 17024, which is the for the certification of persons. And three of our member institutes have already been accredited against that 17024 standard. And in development, as Robert's already mentioned, is the is um, a scheme specifically for the advisors and consultants within UNIDO who provide consultancy advice services in developing countries. Um, so uh, IQA, um, as an accreditation body, has to be very careful about its activities in order to comply properly with um, the requirements of 17011, um, which means that uh, a slightly changed structure has been introduced now, uh, whereas IQA is rather separated into two parts. One part, um, which is uh, under the control of uh, the executive director and secretariat, is for the administration of the assessments of IMCs that take place, managing the program, initiating the assessments, monitoring, and closing off and, and provision of the certificates. The, the other half of IQA, under the IQA chair, has three jobs to do. One is to develop and maintain the policies and processes and report to the board. Another is to select, train and manage the assessor cohort who actually carry out the accreditation assessments and also to do the job of assigning specific assessors to um, triennial assessments when they are carried out. The part of IQA job which must remain um, absolutely separate um, is the, the review and moderation of triennial assessment reports from the assessors uh, and the uh, award of accreditation to the uh, member institutes or, or, or other institutes within our schemes, and then to inform the board via the secretariat uh, that an accreditation has been awarded. The board will then use that accreditation as one half of its decision-making process about the full membership of an IMC. Um, the other half of that decision is to do with being a member in good standing, having paid the subscription, um, which is due. So <clears throat> the big change which has taken place um, sort of administratively now is that the accreditation is carried out by IQA and the board is informed um, to be part of the decision making process for full membership. So how does this all work um, in practice? In terms of um, triennial assessments being carried out or in fact uh, any new um, assessment for a new IMC, new member IMC. There are various steps in the process which are carried out one after the other. Uh, and the process starts about six months before the um, assessment is actually due to take place. This means that um, an institute and the assessors have plenty of time to be prepared uh, before <clears throat> their certification runs out, and, and thus can be uh, renewed in a continuous fashion. Um, following that contact from the Secretariat, 
the appointed lead assessor will contact the Institute um, with a call to um, present the overview of the process that will take place and make all the arrangements for timing of the, uh, of the assessment and also let them know about the assessment pack which will be sent to them, which is a pack of documents, some of which are informative, um, giving information about things like the competence framework, the code of conduct, etc., and some of which are for the Institute to complete and return back to the assessor for document review. The most important of those being the statement of equivalence, um, and I'll come to uh, the principle of equivalence later on. Um, there's then follow up to ensure that uh, the IMC understands everything that has to be done and to agree uh, the assessment plan in terms of the timing, who will be interviewed, what documents will be looked at and so on. The, the Member Institute then submits its statement of equivalence and, and other supporting documents. They're reviewed by the uh, assessors. And <clears throat> there may be some questions and some toing and froing, but basically that will lead up to the assessment taking place. And from now on, we are back in a situation where um, assessments can be carried out on site. Uh, and it is our rule within ICMCI that at least every third assessment should be carried out on site. In between, there can be virtual assessments online. The assessment's done, and then the assessors deliver their report together with their checklist, the statement of equivalent um, items, and their assessment plan to the IQA who will review the report, make a decision about accreditation, and then um, will issue the uh, certificate to the Institute through ICMCI and report back to the board. That's the process which will take place from now on. So in terms of preparing, these are suggestions for institutes. Um, if it is a triennial assessment, then obviously the first thing to do is to look at the report from the previous assessment and make sure that everything that was raised in that assessment in terms of maybe rectifications or recommendations has been done and the evidence can be shown. Uh, it's useful for the Institute to read the CMC manual, which is the rule book for AMCs particularly the, the sections that are, are noted here, which give um, the, if you like, the guidelines, regulations for the, uh, the management and governance of the IMC itself. Um, the new competence framework, uh, the matrix of preferred and acceptable ses assessment techniques and the code of conduct should be studied to make sure that um, the IMC's CMC assessments and the code of conduct are equivalent to those ICMCI standards. Um, and the best way to do this is actually for the Institute to use the statement of equivalence to do a gap analysis and find out if there are, are any things missing and put corrective action in place. Um, there's also an, a basics fact form which gives the background information about the institute also necessary for the assessment. They should be completed and sent back to the lead assessor and then final arrangements made for the assessment. And um, also prepare all the other evidence documents that uh, the institute would like to show the assessors to demonstrate that all their management processes their governance is in place and that they are following the CMC assessment process um, in, in good order. So um, in terms of the competence framework, 
it's important to understand that certain elements of the competence framework uh, were updated and some elements added in the new version um, as compared to the old 2014 version to reflect um, those aspects of consultancy which have become more important um, in today's world. And we've already heard uh, from our keynote speakers about artificial intelligence, about ESG, about social responsibility, environmental responsibility. And therefore, the new competence framework um, has been updated to put more emphasis on um, competence in IT skills for effective communication during consultancy projects for more efficient administration. And also awareness of and the ability to apply the latest technology for diagnostics and solutions, um, very much where artificial intelligence comes into play. But apart from those technical aspects, we've also updated the framework to put a lot more emphasis on interpersonal skills, which in our previous framework was quite a neglected um, area. Um, and, and there was more concentration on the technical skills, whereas it's now realized that actually the soft skills of management consultancy are as important, if not more important, than some of the technical aspects. And so the, the, there's more in the new competence framework about competence in interpersonal skills. There's also uh, very much more now about societal awareness, in particular, uh, the ability to apply in projects the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Also, we, we want consultants to have that competence <clears throat> of um, what we call holistic and transformational thinking, the ability to see the big picture in which their assignment takes place, whether it's the big picture of the client organization itself, and not just that, but also the ecosystem in which the client organization works. And to be able to think about transformations that will sustain improvement for the client company for the future as well. We've also concentrated in the new competence framework on integrating the framework with the code of conduct and with the, the process requirements of ISO 20,700. So in terms of um, when an assessment takes place, it will be important for an IMC to show how it has brought out in, in its CMC assessment process, um, how these new uh, and updated areas of the competence framework have been covered. Um, again, the code of conduct was updated with uh, now five areas of responsibility to the client in terms of professional approach, following the ISO 20,700 guidelines, responsibility to society <clears throat> in terms of ethical behavior, the principles of the UN SG, SDGs, um, so societal responsibility, like ISO 26,000 standard anti-bribery, responsibility to the organization to which the consultant belongs, like upholding lawful policies, practices, and procedures, responsibility to colleagues in terms of practicing diversity and fairness, openness and transparency, and <clears throat> lastly, the area of responsibility to the profession. Um, in other words, upholding the integrity and the reputation of the profession, which will engender public confidence in our profession. And this is particularly important, as I've said earlier, at a time when the consulting industry, and I say industry as opposed to profession, is being uh, is, is under the microscope in terms of its, its behavior, particularly ethical behavior. 
Uh, now, I mentioned equivalence earlier on, and this is a very important aspect for IMCs in terms of the, the standard documents of, of ICMCI. Um, ICMCI does recognize that around the world, there are different cultures, different approaches, different ways of doing things. Uh, and uh, a spirit of diversity allows um, national AMCs to develop their own documents, um, their own, if they want, their own competence framework, their own code of conduct, and so on, as long as they can demonstrate full equivalence to the ICMCI standard documents. And this is the important thing about the statement of equivalence document, which is issued to an institute prior to the assessment. That statement of equivalence is how the institute demonstrates to the ICMCI assessors that they are fully compliant with the ICMCI standards, even though they may have their own versions of them. And those versions are fully mapped and fully compliant with the, the ICMCI standard documents. So that, that's a, a key element of our principle of equivalence in ICMCI, which does give flexibility to a member institute, but that flexibility is ring-fenced ring by a, having to have <clears throat> a compliance with the standard documents of ICMCI. And just as a, <clears throat> an illustration of how the statement of equivalence works, um, on the left-hand side of the form it, it are all the requirements that ICMCI has on an IMC for its management, its governance, and for conducting the CMC assessment process. And the middle column is where the Institute will describe how they fulfill that requirement in their own way using any principle of equivalence if they want. So they could say that they fully use the ICMCI competence framework, or they could say we have developed our own and it maps completely to the ICMCI standard in the following ways. And then the third column is where the Institute can list all of the evidence documents that it wants to show in order to demonstrate its compliance with each area <clears throat> as they go through the statement of equivalence. And in that column, it could be just the name of the document, or if the technology is available, then uh, they could be making hyperlinks. Uh, so in other words, the whole of that document could be used um, as an online directory of evidence that the um, Institute can, can share. I've just got a, a very quick run through what IQA is all about nowadays as a, an accreditation body, how we will apply the ICMCI standard documents under the principle of equivalence, and uh, what the process of assessment will be for the future. I'm happy to take any questions if we have time, <laughs> but if, uh, if we don't, uh, my email address is there. Happy to answer anything that comes in online following the meeting. Thank you very much for your time and uh, uh, your patience. Thank, thank you, Nick. You are perfect on time. Thank you very much. Uh, perfect on time. But uh, if we have uh, the questions, please, uh, I, I guess that uh, we can ask a few questions. No questions? No new message. Let's see. Thanks a lot, uh, Nick. See, I, I've received the messages regarding appreciation of your speech, Nick. 
Thank you. Yes. I'm sure that there will be questions arising from every member institute mm. about one week before its assessment takes place. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be ready for them. No, maybe we should uh, arrange <laughs> sort of gap analysis uh, before uh, the expiration uh, of the accreditation. Otherwise, uh, we, we should, uh, you should do, do something like that. Yeah. Yeah, in advance. So if uh, we do not have any questions for Nick, I thank you really very much. Your presentation was very clear. And of, of course, uh, every, everybody is free to ask uh, for, uh, for details and explanations.